Great. So welcome everyone to today's webinar on forestry for Maine birds with our guests, Sally Stockwell with Maine Audubon and Amanda Mahaffey with Forest Stewards Guild. Uh, my name is Bill Labick and I'm a senior conservationist with Highstead Foundation and serve as a coordinator of the Regional Conservation Partnership Network. This webinar is an offering of the Northeast Bird Habitat Conservation Initiative, whose purpose is to facilitate collaboration among organizations, agencies, and regional conservation partnerships interested in sustain sustaining threatened bird species at the population scale. The initiative's partners include Audubon organizations from Pennsylvania to Maine, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Highstead, and many RCPs across the region. So before we get going, I just wanted to mention that we're recording this session for sharing with our network members who aren't able to join us today. And Sally, before we before you take it away, perhaps we can get around uh, the room, if you will, and uh, and folks can introduce themselves. So if you just tell us your name and where you're from, the organization, and if you're part of an RCP, please uh, feel free to say that as well. Thanks very much. And I'll call on people. I'll just go down the list. I'm jumping over our main speakers, and I'll start with Casey Hamilton. Hi, everybody. My name is... <clears throat> Casey Hamilton. I'm a conservation associate at Highstead, and I help support the H2H RCP. And Connie. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to uh, put my video on during this introductory part because I have online learners behind me. So I'm mostly going to be muted and, and unseen. Uh, anyway, um, I'm in Northwest Connecticut in the town of Kent, and I represent the Litchfield Hills Green Print Collaborative. Great. Thanks, Connie. Uh, Nancy. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, I believe I'm not muted. Uh, so I'm Nancy Patch. I'm with the uh, Department of Forest Parks and Recreation in Vermont, and helped start this forestry for the for for the birds. And I'm also a co-founder and board member of Cold Hollow to Canada, a regional conservation partnership. Excellent. And let's see, Erin. Hi everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, my name is Erin Witham. I'm with. Um, here in my capacity as the coordinator for the Down East Conservation Network, uh, which is a RCP in Hancock and Washington counties in Maine, and uh, I'm based in Southwest Harbor. Great to see you, Aaron. Uh, let's hear from Jeff. Hi, Jeff Fredrickson with Mass Audubon. I, I work with our version of the Forces for the Birds program. Um, I'm not formally associated with any any RCP. Maybe MassCon. I mm -hmm. I work a lot with. Great. Thanks, Jeff and Sarah Barker. Hi, I'm Sarah Barker from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and I um, direct our Cornell Land Trust Bird Conservation Initiative. And um, with that, I work with Bill Labick and Katie on um, the. Northeast Bird Habitat Conservation Initiative. And um, I'm really excited to hear more about this Forestry for the Main Birds program today. So thanks. Great, I think that's everybody. Did I miss anybody perhaps on the phone that's not uh, on video? No, okay. So um, I've asked the speakers when they'd like to take questions, if you had a burning question maybe in the transition from one speaker to another, that might be a good time to do that. Um, but also, for the most part, if you could hold your questions to the end, that would be, that'd be welcomed. Uh, so with that, I think I'm turning it over to Sally Stockwell. Actually, first, Amanda's gonna give just kind of a quick background, uh, a quick overview of the background of this program and how it got started here in comparison, and especially for those of you from outside of Maine, you might be interested to hear a little bit about that. So we'll take it away, right. Amanda. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, so Amanda Mahaffey, Forest Stewards Guild over in uh, Brunswick, Maine. Um, and just for you know, uh, Zoom etiquette, if you feel like turning off your camera because you've been on too many Zoom calls this week, um, I'm okay with that. So feel free to make yourself invisible so you can uh, you know, kick back and enjoy. Um, so Sally and I have been doing workshops uh, in Maine on forestry for Maine birds for uh, 
I think it was 2013 was our first one. Um, and so we're, we've been tag teaming and today during our presentation, we're gonna kind of go back and forth during, uh, for some of the different slides and, and hone in on different sections. Um, so we've, uh, we probably won't take a full hour and a half uh, to get through everything, but we welcome your questions along the way. So please feel free to pipe up in the chat box or um, if we're really not noticing, then you can unmute your phone and, uh, and just uh, and ask a question out loud. Um, but um, just to provide a little context, so in Maine, we've been lucky to work on this program since 2013, but it really uh, came to pass first in Vermont. Um, uh, so the Vermont Forest Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, Nancy Patch, uh, being a key person there, um, and then uh, Audubon Vermont um, teamed up and uh, came up with this program. And they have a much more in-depth history that they can tell you about it and the, and the early stages of de developing the program for the first time. Um, but their efforts began in 2008, which feels like a long time ago now. Um, but the idea of pairing uh, silviculture um, and kind of the, the lens of foresters, and I am a licensed forester, so pairing that lens of looking at the forest for timber, for, you know, for forest products and for woods water recreation in addition, um, and then pairing that with kind of the birds focus, seeing the forest for the birds and what can birds tell us about what's happening in the forest and about the choices that you can make as a forester, as a logger or as a landowner um, that can impact what's going on in a forest stand. And also, as we'll get into it, um, looking at the landscape level, um, that seemed to really resonate with a whole lot of folks. Um, so since Vermont started their program in 2008, um, Maine has picked it up, uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut has a Foresters for the Birds program. I've been involved in helping Rhode Island uh, develop theirs. Um, I'm uh, going to be talking with folks from Michigan next week, um, and I'm working on a uh, on a Forestry for Oregon Birds project. I also got to go to North Carolina. Um, where the Audubon Vermont folks were partnering with them um, on getting, you know, getting the program started. So in different places, sometimes it has a slightly different name. The original is Foresters for the birds. In Maine, we decided to adapt it to Forestry for Maine birds and, and other wildlife. Um, but it's a, it's a really great program. Um, and it, the, the model of seeing the forest for the birds seems to resonate well with foresters, with conservation professionals, with woodland owners, and with loggers. Um, so, Sally and I will share a little bit more about why birds, uh, you know, why, why forestry for Maine birds and uh, how we've been able to kind of grow this program and what's it like going to a workshop. So with that, Sally will get us started. Okay, thanks Amanda. And uh, I, it, I know based on your introductions that it sounds like a number of you are already familiar with this program in one version or another. So I, this will be Maine's version of the program. But I really want to talk about it um, at, a, at a introductory level for folks like Aaron who really aren't as familiar with it. So bear with me, those of you who already know a little bit about it. Um, so as Amanda said, we, we started this Forestry for the Maine Birds program in 2013. We actually started the program, we started doing workshops in combination with Maine Audubon, the Forest Stewards Guild, the Maine Forest Service, and Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And um, si since then, and that partnership has evolved and remains very strong today. So that's pretty exciting. It's part of, part of the real success of the program, I think. So it, it, we're gonna run through a program that we would typically do at these workshops, either for foresters, for landowners, for loggers. And we start by saying, you know, why birds? Well there are many polls that have been surveys that have been done across the country with small family woodland owners where wildlife and in particular birds always comes up as one of the top one to three reasons why they keep their woodland, why they enjoy their woodland, and um, people get excited about birds. You know, you can, you can see them, you can hear them, there are all kinds of different birds, they're wonderful songs, it, it, it captures people's imaginations and helps connect them with the land and with their woodland. Another reason why we focused on birds is, be, is because they're easier to see, they're easier to hear, they're easier to find than some of these other wildlife species, lynx, marten, moose, you, you know, brook trout, we, we all see those, but they are a little bit harder to find. And so we use birds as a surrogate, birds and their habitat needs as a surrogate for 
other wildlife needs as well, with the idea that if we focus in on the habitat needs of a variety of bird species and we manage our woodlands to enhance those habitat features, then we also provide habitat for all kinds of other wildlife. And of course, landowners care about other wildlife and they care about recreation opportunities, hunting, fishing, uh, or even just uh, aesthetics. So we take all of that into consideration. Another reason why we focused on birds is because we know, based on breeding bird survey data starting back in 1970, that many of our familiar forest bird species have been experiencing precipitous declines. And I imagine a number of you, if not all of you, heard about the research paper that came out last year in uh, <clears throat> science that documented we've lost about 30% of all of our birds since 1970. And our forest birds are one of the groups that have seen a pretty precipitous decline, at least in, in many species. So here's an example of one of those species, the viri, that is, you can see this line here that shows just a dramatic decline starting from 1970 going to, um, let's see, 20, this is a little bit old, but you know, 2015 or so, and it's continued. So part of the goal of this project is to try to at least stall that decline, if not actually reverse it. And why Maine? Well, we love to show this map because you can readily see the darker the color, the darker red colors show where the most number of forest bird species are found on breeding bird survey routes that occur all across the United States. And so on a typical route here in Maine, we get up to 40 different species in one survey. And you can see in many other places of the country, it's half or, or as little as you know, zero, zero to 10 species. So we have many species that come here to Maine that breed here. And here's a, here's a, a good reason why. National Audubon put together a map a number of years ago that illustrated the last best remaining blocks of forest land in the eastern US along the Atlantic Flyway. And you can see pretty quickly <laughs> that that dark green blob in Maine just really jumps out. There is nowhere else that still has so much forest habitat available for these breeding birds. And um, as a result of that, it, it, much of the area has been designated as a globally significant important bird area. Important bird areas, for those of you who are unfamiliar with them, are places where there are either many different species that are all found in one place that are breeding there, or a lot of individuals of one or two species, and it's critical habitat for those. In this case, we have many different species that come here to breed. And so every year, you know, we have these the amazing migration that happens where species are returning from southern U.S., the Central America, South America, and they are, are coming back to Maine. And for those of you who are birders, the springtime is always such an exciting time to welcome back our friends. We think of them as our residents, but in truth, they spend most of their year outside of Maine, but we don't like to say, admit that. Why do they come back here? Because we have the, the the state is about 90% forested. We have almost 18 million acres of forest. It's very diverse. We have northern hardwoods, northern softwoods, northern mixed woods, and oak pine forest all in this little state. <clears throat> we, and, and the birds make this long migration because there are abundant places for them to nest and also lots of insects. Lots of insects means they can find the food they need to feed their young, raise their young, and send the next generation of their species on their way. It's also one of the other benefits of coming all this way back to Maine is because we have really long days. Lots of light, 
They can be out there collecting food from 4.30 in the morning until 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, which means that they often have multiple clutches throughout the season, two, sometimes even three different clutches. So um, after we started doing these workshops and meeting with landowners and foresters, we decided that we really needed a, a number of resources to provide to, the, to folks in addition to the workshops. So over the course of several years, we worked together to first put together the Forestry for Maine Birds, which is our most detailed guidebook. That's the one on the top right, right, right here. Oops, sorry. Right there. Um, and then we next put together the Woodland Owner's Guide, which is sort of a condensed version of this one, a little bit more accessible. It's got the essence of the, what we're trying to convey in the guidebook, but uh, not as detailed. And then we also put together a special book for loggers, which, which depicts kind of the essence of what we're trying to accomplish in the program, but is really designed to think about the operations and how you what you are actually doing in the woods and how that can what th kinds of things a logger can actually do to help create habitat good habitat for birds and this has been really well received now in some other states you know we've heard from folks that oh no we don't really we don't want to deal with the loggers they they don't seem that receptive we have two professional logging organizations in the state who we worked with to actually develop the brochure. And as soon as it was done, they said, hey, can we, get, can we get copies to send to every single one of our contractors? I think people will be really interested in this. And then Amanda and I and um, a former colleague also did a series of short presentations at their annual training workshops. So the, the loggers have been, it has, have been an integral part of our program here in Maine. And then we've also worked with a group, the American Forester Foundation, on reaching out to landowners and developing some additional outreach materials, including this set of what they call trading cards that depicts the 20 different species that we're sort of zeroed in on here in Maine and helps identify them, talks a little bit about their habitat requirements. And you can, and it's on a little ring here, they can take out in the field with them. So now it's time for your first quiz. These are our 20 birds that we uh, are focusing in on in Maine. They are of conservation concern to it for one reason or another. And, um, and so we wanna ask you how much, how well do you know your birds for starters? And then we'll talk a little bit about them. We have a lot of smart birding folks on here. Um, we'll let the poll run for another 30 seconds or so. Um, but we know, <laughs> boy, we know, um, we know a lot of you probably have some of the answers well at hand. Um, usually when we put this slide up during workshops, then uh, you, know, you get a mixture of the folks that know their birds. Folks are like, I think that's a red bird. I think I've seen it before. Um, and folks are like, I don't know, I'm here to learn. Um, but it is really cool to see all 20 of them. Um, and the more workshops I go to with Sally, the more I learn about forest birds. So it's always pretty exciting. Um, all right, a minute has gone by. I'm going to end the polling and share the results. So let's see, Sally, do you wanna talk about our poll answers? Can you see them? I can, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so the first one was scarlet tanagers don't like oak trees, false. They are typically found in the tops of big old oak trees. Everybody got oven birds. They, that's our, you know, that, that's one of the easiest species for people to learn. And that's part and Sally, of the Can you point out which birds are which in the 20? I guess most folks here probably know what they are, but. Yeah, okay, so the poll, okay. I just had to move the poll out of the way. Right. Scarlet um, tanager is probably pretty easy to find. So scarlet tanager. Nests and tops of uh, nests and sings in the tops of tall oak trees. Um, the next one, oven birds. This is our, our very noisy teacher, teacher, teacher bird that everybody knows from the woods. Chestnut sided warblers. This guy right here. Um, 
most people got that one right okay. that they like oh sorry that's i'm looking at this one there this we go okay this is inside of warblers they um we chose them because they like these little gap openings in the middle of mature forests they can also be found in young forests but in our case we're really focused in on trying to enhance mature forest characteristics because that's what most of our forest birds prefer so chestnut sided warblers will will nest in these uh, and feed in these little gap openings canada warblers that's what i was pointing to at first a uh, few people said they nest in the tops of pines nope these are one of our ground nesters they nest right on the bottom near shrubby thick shrubby areas often associated with water in fact i was just out in the field on tuesday where we heard one of these and also northern water thrushes that and and i love their song because it kind of goes like this they're they're very difficult to see because they're very secretive but they're a great um, species. Northern Perulas, everybody got that one right. These guys here, they specialize in building their nests using old man's beard lichen and are often at the very tops of uh, trees. They, they have this sort of ring kind of call. And then Viries, a few people got that one wrong. Viries here, uh, where's our Viri, right here. That's the one we just saw the picture of earlier. Viries really are often associated with water. They like to be down on the forest floor looking for insects. They like being next to water. Yesterday with the Canada, or the Tuesday Canada warblers, we also heard viries in the same area. And then Eastern wood peewees, which are here. Nope, where's our Eastern wood peewee? Here, Eastern wood peewees um, and our uh, olive sided flycatchers both catch insects on the wing. So as you can see, based on the polls, we've, we've tried to select a variety of species that use different habitat features in the forest. And we've tried to choose species that were relatively easy to identify by sight and or by sound. And the one kind of thing that we didn't tap, touch yet are the species that use snags, like the yellow-bellied sapsucker. So let's go on now and look at, in a little more detail at a couple of these species. Can you, can you hide the um, poll now? I'll try to figure out how to do it. I thought I did. But... I just can't. I got, got it. Okay. All right, so this is a great little graphic that Audubon Vermont put together that we stole with permission. And it shows how each different species uses a different part of the forest to nest in. That's why we have so many different birds that come back to Maine that, that breed here, because there are lots of different features. But if these features are missing in the forest, then you're not gonna have those species showing up. So you get everything from here's our scout tanager, big tall oaks, there's our Canada warbler down in these shrubs by water, um, also the veery by water, there's the sapsucker that likes dead standing trees or snags, the chestnut sided warbler that likes little gaps, um, blue headed vireos that kind of like the middle story there, and the eastern wood peewee that likes these little gaps because they can fly out into the gap and catch insects in the wing, blue-headed, excuse me, black, um, black throated blue warblers, love hobble bush. So they're often found lower in the canopy. And so I like to think of the forest as a little bit like an apartment building. And if you have an apartment building that just has two stories with uh, two apartments on each story versus an apartment building that has 10 stories with five apartments on each level, you're going to be able to pack a lot more species and a lot more individuals of each of those species into that taller apartment building. So that's kind of what we're aiming for. And in our guidebook, we've developed these pages that describe the species, 
how to identify it, where, what their habits are. And then we have these great little graphics that were developed by Don Morgan that depict where you typically find, what type of habitat, what type of forest you typically find that bird in. So again, chestnut sided warbler, they like that little, little, little gap opening. Oops, sorry, very sensitive um, to the mouse touch. And, uh, oh, and then backing up a second, on the side of each page, we've outlined which forest type they prefer. So we have northern softwood, northern mixed wood, northern hardwood, and oak pine. And in the case of the chestnut-sided warbler, you can see that their preference is northern hardwood, but they're also found in northern mixed wood. And then we've also looked at, are they in um, old forest, intermediate age forest, or young forest? And in this case, you think of it as young or you know, an opening, young opening within an older forest. So we've outlined that and then where do, where, where do you typically find the birds in the understory, the midstory, or the overstory, and where do they typically nest? So let's look at a little more detail of the Canada warbler. They're one of my favorite species. And these, um, we, we chose to include Canada warblers in our list of 20 priority species because like the Viri, their populations have declined dramatically. Again, here's a, a closer up view of the habitat preferences that they enjoy. And then here's, a, here's another example of how they have really declined. And now I'm gonna play for you a real recording of what they sound like as opposed to me trying to imitate. You hear that all right? Just a little bit. Maybe, could you move your phone a little closer to the computer? Sorry, the live birds are much more fun. <laughs> ah, well. We can hear, we can hear just a little bit, but yeah, they are, they are quiet sometimes. Okay. <clears throat> so another species that we chose the yellow-bellied yellow sapsucker because they really require these dead standing snags. They often prefer hardwoods, young, younger age hardwoods, or I mean stands of younger, what well, you think of as early successional hardwoods, poplars, birches, those sorts of things. And they will drill holes. If you've never seen, they drill holes on the tree. They collect both the sap and the insects that are attracted to the sap, which is why they're called sap suckers. And now just for a little fun, for those of you who don't know as much about birds, you'll notice that all woodpeckers have these really stiff tail feathers that lets them hold themselves, prop themselves up against the trunk of the tree. And then they, they have tongues that literally wrap all the way around their skull back here so that once they go have a hole and they go, they can lengthen that tongue all the way into the hole far into the tree to grab the insects they're looking for. And each different woodpecker has a different drumming sound. Let's see if I can, if this one will be any louder for you. I'm, um, I'm using the Merlin app. And we'll see if this works any better. We can hear it just a little bit at the beginning. All right. It worked during our trial run. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> Anyway, they have a, a drumming that starts kind of fast and then slows down. And, and just like with unique songs for each different songbird, each different woodpecker also has a unique drumming pattern that you can get to learn. And so for all of our woodpeckers, having dead standing snags or decaying 
trees is a key component because they not only feed there but also nest in cavities in those trees. And, and here's a species where the population had been declining but is now starting to rebound a little bit. So that's actually good news. And part of the reason is because of having more habitat available for them with the trees. Now wood thrush are another species like the viri that has declined dramatically over the last 40 years. And we bring your attention to the wood thrush because they are um, kind of a poster child for species that are really struggling with habitat fragmentation. Can you hear that? No? Yeah, yeah, just a little bit, yeah. Okay, so that was, that's embedded in the slide. Anyway, they, like all of our thrushes, they have this wonderful sort of um, flute-like sound. They, uh, thrushes have a unique vocal chords in that they can, they emit two sounds at the same time. So you get this harmonic quality to the song, which is magical. And wood thrush are found in uh, mixed woods, dominated largely by hardwoods, and they are often found in that middle area, the mid-story, six to 30 feet of the forest, but they often feed on the floor of the forest, you know, amongst the leaves, looking for invertebrates and that sort of thing. But they, um, their population has dramatically declined, and one of the reasons is because they are what we call an area sensitive species. So we have a number of our songbirds here in Maine that, and elsewhere in the Northeast that are really, you're more likely to find them in larger blocks of forest. In this case, at least 250 acres. And in where they're, it's part of a larger landscape of forest. So up to 2,500 acres because then you, you, have a, you tend to have better quality habitat and larger blocks of habitat. And so um, when you have, where you have, and they can, they can at, when the blocks of habitat are larger, their home ranges can be, and the habitat quality is better, their habit, home range size can be smaller and you can pack more species in. And the, the shape of those forest blocks is really important as well. So for those species that are looking for what we call interior forest habitat, away from the edges, away from predators that are, like, are more common along those edges, a, a block like this that has the same area as a block like this is usually preferred by these interior nesting species. So at this point, we're going to pause and see if there are any questions, and then I'm going to turn it over to Amanda to talk a little bit more about how to um, go about doing habitat assessments and putting together a management plan. But before yeah. we do that, we want to start by asking you a little bit. Oh, that's the same. Poll. I know. I don't know how to get to the second poll. See, because I went to relaunch polling. We have another poll. We have another poll for you. We do. I just don't know how to get to it. <laughs> I think I can do it. Okay. There. Oh. Hold on a second. Let's see, end polling here. Sorry, thanks for your patience with the uh, technical difficulties. Usually, usually when I do polls, I have all the questions that, ah, this is it. Thank you, Bill. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Take it away, Amanda. All right. So um, if you don't mind uh, filling out the poll while I chit chat over the top. Um, so, so far in the workshop, uh, Sally's given an overview about, you know, why birds, uh, why Maine, um, and then she's given an introduction to a suite of forest birds. And uh, when we go to different parts of Maine, like if we go into down east Maine where there's more northern softwood forest, then we would tweak the birds that we that we would present about a little bit um, versus if we go into oak pine forest in York County. Um, so we, we always adapt this slideshow a little bit depending on uh, where we are and who the audience is. 
Um, but now we're getting to the point in the presentation where we have to tie it back to the management side. So um, Maine, uh, like most of New England, is largely privately owned. Um, and while we do, while we have uh, worked with folks that are part of the much, much larger industrial ownerships, um, then a significant portion of uh, Maine also is, is in small private forest land ownerships. And so that means working on management plans um, and working with landowners to help them identify what they care about in their land and hoping that we can integrate uh, birds and silviculture as uh, part of what they want to have happen on their land. So I think we can probably end the poll and share the results. I'm going to try doing that and polling and share results. So yay, everybody is already <laughs> doing some but wants to do more for forest bird habitat. Bingo. OK, I'm going to close that poll for now. Um, but actually, before I do, I'll just mention, so um, everybody here uh, wants to do more. Um, we also do come across landowners, and uh, you know, especially if we do a workshop with a, um, you know, with a, with a land trust as a partner um, or with a woodland owner association as a partner. There's folks that are interested that care about wildlife, um, but and a lot of landowners do care about wildlife, according to the National Woodland Owners Survey, um, but they don't know how to help, so they come to a workshop. There are some landowners that we come across that are more interested in other fish or wildlife, and again, birds are a good way to help folks see the forest for the birds and understand the values of forest structure, um, but this helps them get to their other values as well. And then there are landowners that are focused on other forest values, um, so we're hoping that we can introduce them to a little, a little side of uh, something different. So this trail map um, kind of gives an overview of how landowners get from what do I do with this land that I own to implementing silviculture on their land. And of course, with all of this, it takes time and we're in it for the journey. So the first one, um, if you can hit down on the slide, Sally, is the landowner goals and objectives, or landowner objectives and goals. So as a forester, um, so yes, I think if you advance the slide, it just highlights the, there we go. Bing. No, I, had to, I, had, I had to have the clicker on it. Ah, okay, no worries. Um, so uh, as, when a forester meets with a landowner, the first thing that they wanna do is to help the landowner identify what their objectives and goals are for that land. Um, if you're a land trust and you own land, then you know recreation is a big piece of it. Uh, you know trails, uh, maintaining uh, enjoyment by uh, land trust members and the public um, are all important. And then also things like controlling invasive species and sustaining wildlife habitat. Those are typical goals that come up for some landowners, of course. Uh, you know timber management, um, maintaining and creating a legacy for future generations. Um, those are all really important. So it, it all starts with the landowner's goals and objectives. And then as we continue along the trail map, well, so that's what they want to have happen, but it all depends on the current habitat conditions. So what is out there on the land? Um, does it make sense? You know, what, what, what kind of bird, what bird species could you expect to, uh, to enhance habitat for on your land? So if you're in York County and you really want to have uh, habitat for a Canada warbler, that might be a little bit challenging potentially. Um, if you're in, uh, whereas if you're in an area that has a lot of northern softwood, and Sally, you can you might be smiling if I'm mixing up my birds, but <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but if you're if you're in a in, if you're in a northern softwood area, like if you're in down east Maine or far northern Maine, um, then there's plenty of Canada warbler habitat, and there are things that you as a landowner or as a logger um, or as a forester can do uh, to do something with those habitat conditions and enhance that forest bird habitat. So you start with your objectives and goals, and then you have to understand what's there on the land. And with that, you take a few more steps, and then you can revise your objectives and goals. So instead of being as broad as we want to enhance wildlife habitat, you might have something more specific, like I want to enhance habitat for Canada warbler on my 20 acres that is dominated by spruce fir in Calais, Maine, something like that. So you can uh, revise your goals and objectives accordingly, inclu which includes reference to those wildlife habitat goals and forest bird goals. So once you have your goals and objectives and an understanding of your current habitat conditions in mind, um, ideally with a forest stand inventory com completed as well, then you want to capture that in a forest management plan. And foresters should say to the landowner that the document, the, the actual plan is supposed to be for you. It's supposed to capture your goals and objectives and put it in a plan, uh, you know, in, in terminology that is forestry, you know, rigorous forestry specific. Um, but it really should be a plan for the landowner. 
and plans in Maine, and I think in most states in New England, uh, need to be revised or updated every 10 years. Um, so hopefully the land will be in your family that long and longer. Um, but you can take out your plan anytime. You can adapt it. You can add, uh, add you know, some of these bird pages to it. If you come to a workshop and you, and you say, you know what, I really like chestnut-sided warblers. I think that when I do a timber harvest two years from now, according to my plan, I want to make sure that I benefit that particular bird then you can add the bird page into your forest management plan. It should be a document for you. But the bottom line is within that forest management plan, dot, 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 that should also spell out the silvicultural options. And you're all probably familiar with the term silviculture. It is the art and science of forest management. So there's definitely a science behind it um, and understanding the silvics of why trees grow the way they do um, as they take different forms in different stages of growth. How do they benefit different forest birds? Um, and then there's the uh, then there's the art part. So when you're when you have your boots on the ground and you're deciding, you know, looking around like what what trees do I take? What do I leave? Where's the you know how's the logger going to get his equipment in here? Um, you know how far are we to the markets, etc. Um, that's kind of the art part. How you make all of those pieces come together and you take the science and apply it. So silviculture, the art and science of forest management. So all of that silviculture, forest management, revised goals and objectives should be captured in your forest management plan. Your plan should also include a stand map. And for folks that aren't used to looking at, uh, at a forest stand in this way, a stand map can be kind of a revolutionary idea. Um, so instead of walking through your woods, as we all do, and just seeing how the forest changes around you, the stand map helps delineate the stand boundaries um, and helps you understand how different treatments can apply in different areas. It also can help you understand how different forest birds might utilize different habitat that's been created, been created through the management on your land over time. So the different stands that are numbered in this picture um, would, would provide slightly different habitat for different forest birds. Um, the rectangular box uh, on the outside is the property, but there's also the landscape scale. And usually when, uh, when we do these workshops, we like to print out like a giant map size blow up of the approximately 2,000 acres around the property where the workshop is taking place. Um, and so folks can see the context. So Sally mentioned the, the wood thrush, for example. So they care about interior forest habitat. So if you look at, at this stand map, you can get, or at, if you look at this stand map, you can get a sense of what blocks of forest seem to provide interior forest habitat within the property. But if you zoom out to the you know 2,000 acres or so, on adjacent ownerships around it, that'll give you a much better sense of, in general, is this the kind of neighborhood that the wood thrush would want to move to or live in? So uh, we want to think about forestry for Maine birds at multiple scales. Okay, all you people out there, it's time to get engaged. We're going to do our handy habitat assessment. Oh, were you going to say something, Sally? No, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I just okay. moved it a little too early for you, so sorry. Oh, oh, no worries. Okay. So. Um, can you see me? <laughs> yes. Okay. So wherever you are right now out there, all nine of us on, oh, all ten of us on this uh, on this webinar. Um, so take your three fingers and turn them in. So on your left hand we have live things, and on your right hand we have not live things. So left hand, this is a reminder for overstory, midstory, and understory. On your right hand, it's also size-wise. This is a reminder of snags and standing decaying trees, coarse woody material, and fine woody material. So when we do a workshop in the woods, then we get everybody to get out their handy assessment tool. So you can start seeing the forest and thinking about overstory, midstory, and understory, and thinking about uh, dead things also. Standing decaying trees um, and snags, uh, coarse woody material, and fine woody material. Um, so I think in the, oh, and yeah. In the interest of time, Sally, do you want me to go through all of them or just kind of leave it at that for now? That's fine. You can, we can go through the next. There you go. Okay. Um, so in the, I think this is in the landowner guide. Um, once you get the, the three and three for your handy assessment tool, there's some bonus features. So while you have live things on your left hand, if you put your thumb up, that also reminds you to think about gaps. Um, which Sally mentioned the eastern wood peewee and olive-sided flycatcher and chestnut-sided warbler are some of the birds that like gaps. So that reminds you to look for gaps. Um, and then picky down on the water, um, you think about, about birds that like water and like uh, wetter areas. Um, and then on your right hand, um, once you've done our 
uh, snags, coarse woody material, and fine woody material, when we think about that oven bird, the oven bird cares about the leaf litter. So we want to make sure that uh, that you know leaf litter in a hardwood or mixed wood forest is sufficiently present so that your oven bird can uh, create a little nest. And then, uh, oh, one more thing is the tree size. So both for live and for dead things, size, size matters. Uh, the bigger, the better. So the bigger the snag, the more uh, species and the more individual uh, members of a wildlife uh, uh, unit can use that snag um, or that decaying tree. And the same thing for live trees, the bigger and the older, the better. Um, insects can, uh, can, can root into, um, into bark of, of more developed older trees um, much more readily than they can in, in younger kind of middle-aged trees. So tree size matters. So again, just as a quick review, you, on your left hand, you would look for overstory, midstory, and understory, thinking about do we have a lot of forest cover in the overstory, a lot of forest cover in the midstory, a lot of understory, um, and then you want to remember gaps and water. On your other hand, you're thinking about dead things because birds will key in on these features as well. Snags, uh, coarse wooden material and fine wooden material, leaf litter if you're thinking about your oven bird, and just remember to look for the bigger, the better. I think that also goes for coarse wooden material um, as well. So as we go to our next slide, um, this is similar to the, the first graphic that uh, Vermont, another one we borrowed from Vermont, um, showed us. But when just when you look at this with your handy assessment tool, if you're looking at the overstory, more vigorous canopy trees might mean that you have a click, 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 scarlet tanager. And <laughs> Sally's going to tell me if I get them wrong. Um, if, you, if you see features like more canopy gaps in this particular uh, photo that's a little bit uh, further in the background, then you might find a bird like an olive sided flycatcher, right? Am I close or is that the wood peewee? Peewee. Okay, sorry, peewee. <laughs> I'm still learning my birds. Um, but again, with your handy assessment. And then the mid story, so we have uh, our mid story kind of six to 30 feet in the air. Um, there are some birds that key in on having a denser midstory. So the wood thrush in particular likes having that midstory, that you know, well-developed midstory. Um, as we go on, you're looking for other features, um, snags and cavity trees. Um, this doesn't have the best examples, but hey, they're there. Um, so that's our, our yellow-bellied sapsucker again, I think. Um, so da -da 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 and then in the dense understory, uh, the black-throated blue warbler, zoo, zoo, zee, <coughs> zee, <coughs> that's kind of what it sounds like, sorry. Um, anyway, so the black-throated blue warbler likes hiding in the dense understory. And then uh, we want to have sufficient ground cover so that you can have, oh, come on. Did we get a picture of the oven bird? No. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, this is the, uh, the... sorry, who, who is that? That it doesn't have anything there, but you already okay. talked about the oven bird. Okay, so we should have an oven bird there because there's a really cute picture of one. Um, but uh, so more down wood. Um, uh, sorry, Sally, remind me. Uh, is this our, our, our rough grouse? Yeah. So Sally, you want to talk about the rough grouse and the drumming? So rough grouse need these bit large dead down logs on the forest floor because the males will stand up on that forest floor and they'll start. Um, pumping their wings and the noise then reverberates through the dead log out through the forest floor. And that's essentially the equivalent of their song that's attracting the female for mating. Yeah, so big there are no down big dead down logs. There's, there's no little baby chicks. Yeah, so that's why uh, size matters. Big dead wood is important. So some of the features we'll go through um, here are also, of course, in the Forester for Maine Birds guidebook for the, in the Forester's Guide. So again, um, from the big picture perspective, and we paired forest stand types, uh, what we're used to talking about in terminology as foresters, with uh, forest habitat types. So oak pine, northern softwood, northern hardwood, and mixed wood, as they're labeled in this slide. Um, and within that, they're paired up to think about forest type, age, and tree size. So in our next slide, we get a little bit of an example of some of the birds that key in on those different vegetation layers and cover. So again, scarlet tanager, you can read all the, all the birds that really like having a nice dense overstory. So those features are important. And then we have a list of the birds that key in on that midstory, you know, six to 30 feet. And then there are some that really care the most about what's happening in the understory. 
So when you're doing your handy habitat assessment, you look for, is there a lot of cover, some cover, or not much? That's what we usually do, um, when, especially in the field with, uh, with landowners or foresters being introduced to this for the first time. Um, then as we continue, what does that look like? So this is the more graphic depiction um, of what very low, low, medium, and high cover uh, looks for. And uh, I like to reassure people, the birds aren't reading the, you know, the guidebook. <laughs> so if you're, you know, 30 to 70 for medium is a pretty big range, but it's just generally when you look at it, is it, is it like dense? It's like, oh yeah, this is really, really dense. Um, so uh, just the differences in the vegetative, veg vegetation and layer cover um, that birds are keying into in those different strata. Next, we look at stand age and tree size. So here, again, you can spend more time with this uh, in the Forestry for Maine Birds guidebook, which is on maineaudubon.org slash FFMB. Um, you can download it, and I think we might have some copies uh, that we could possibly send you. Um, but again, here we paired kind of the forestry terminology of, uh, you know, seedling, sapling. Um, in the intermediate class, we had some discussions about single-age pole timber versus uh, two-age pole timber with a partial overstory. Um, so depending on the equipment that had been used to harvest that stand in the past, and especially in softwood stands, um, versus older forests, you know, and what we think of as maturing or kind of the small saw timber uh, size class um, versus the older and more complex large saw timber. Uh, birds care a lot about how old the trees are, and in Maine they grow pretty slowly, so size and age are, you know, can be correlated when you get to, you know, a big size um, and, and an older age, but older, bigger, better from a bird's perspective, because there's just more microhabitat features that are available. We can continue. So um, there's a lot of benefit to promoting late successional forest. Um, for one, uh, overall in Maine, um, there's room for uh, having more of it. Um, there's parts of the state that have been very uh, heavily harvested uh, you know, historically. Um, and uh, here, Sally got to measure a 37 inch in diameter uh, at breast height uh, hemlock tree. Um, I hope that tree is still around. Um, but, uh, yay, nice. Um, but you know, these larger older trees, um, they're really good as legacy trees from a wildlife perspective. They provide more uh, ecosystem service in terms of carbon sequestration. They're also really good for climate resiliency and they provide, that's all in addition to providing really in, in, in essential forest structure. Um, for forest birds and for other species of wildlife. As we go on, another feature to look for are these small gaps. So again, if you were to think about this in terms of mimicking natural disturbance, um, you know, in an oak pine forest and we have these windstorms that happen occasionally, more occasionally these days, um, you get blowdown and you get natural gaps. And so timber harvest can mimic that. And what those gaps allow, what you see in this picture, um, that nice white pine regeneration, that's coming in on the sunny side of that gap. So the white pine is able, as an early successional species, is able to, you know, try to occupy that gap more quickly and help continue the forest and continue, um, you know, creating and enhancing forest bird habitat as well. Then standing deadwood. Uh, we talked a bit about this, but, uh, you know, but standing deadwood, um, we like to tell loggers where it's operationally safe to leave standing snags and decaying trees, we encourage them to do so. Um, in some circumstances, loggers have a choice of where they harvest or where they don't harvest. Um, and officially, they're supposed to get rid of all, uh, all hazard trees before they begin really getting into an operation. But um, if there's a possibility of leaving snags, you know, the more the merrier, the bigger the better, um, then we encourage them to do that. Let's see. Downwoody material. Um, so that's another another important piece. So uh, we really try to tell landowners that messy is good. <laughs> um, so uh, there, we've had landowners come to our workshops before, and they really like they take pride in creating that park-like forest in their backyard um, or in their woodlot. And uh, after coming to our workshops, they've you know they've rethought of it and thought you know I think I buy into this messy is good thing. So in certain areas, uh, they will leave mess <laughs> um, and show us the next time we visit. Um, and, uh, and, and messy means more down woody material, uh, you know, coarse and fine woody material that provides that habitat. It's important because uh, there, there are other species that also use this to, uh, to you know, use coarse woody material to traverse areas, it's sort of like a mini highway 
for short foresters trying to uh, traverse regeneration or raspberries. It's another, <laughs> it's another uh, handy feature to have on the landscape, but downwood material is, uh, is pretty essential. And our leaf litter. So here's the picture of the oven bird that I was looking for. Um, if we're in a workshop where we have hardwood leaf litter, then I will actually scrape together a little pile of, uh, of hardwood leaves and create a little sample oven bird nest. So these are really cool birds. Um, and one cool thing is that they call, they seem to call all, all day long uh, or just more frequently than other birds that you hear at 4.30 in the morning. Um, and so it's my first bird that I learned. Um, so teacher, 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 or as we tell some people, pizza, pizza, pizza. It sounds more like teacher, but oven bird, pizza. All right, we can go on to the next slide. Um, we also want to point out native biodiversity is something that's really important uh, for, for maintaining a healthy forest for birds and for other wildlife. Um, you guys might be familiar with the, uh, with the top right uh, critter over there. That's an uh, Asian longhorn beetle, um, which is not welcome anywhere. Uh, it's non-native um, and it has, it's uh, decimated hardwood trees in Western Massachusetts and other places. Um, in the bottom left, I believe that's our native insect, actually the spruce budworm. Um, and so that actually is different. It's native and it has a cyclical life cycle. Um, and uh, Sally reminded me, was it the uh, bay-breasted warbler? And, yep, yep. Yeah. bay-breasted, Cape Mays, black pole warblers are all cue right into that. Um, and their populations will increase when there's an explosion of those, which is happening right now up in Quebec. Oh boy, yeah. So spruce budworm is, uh, is devastating to forests um, and our main forest service, uh, the Forest Health Division uh, and their partners in New Brunswick and Quebec are definitely keeping an eye on this. But one of the side benefits is that these native insects, when they get into a kind of outbreak mode, do provide an awful lot of rich nutrients uh, for forest birds. So something to keep an eye on. We can go to the next slide. And we'll talk about riparian areas and wetland forests. So this is a beautiful picture. And as you look at a landscape, um, you know, landscape photos, or as you walk through your favorite woodlot, um, some, some of the features that really stick out are riparian areas and wetlands and wetland forests. And for forest birds, those are really, really important features as well, um, especially because of the, the linear nature of uh, riparian areas with streams that zigzag across the landscape. Those provide natural travel corridors um, for, for birds and for other wildlife. And I think Sally's gonna talk a little bit more about that um, in a few slides. Um, also, uh, just thinking about you know, vernal pools and significant vernal pools, um, you know, within, uh, you know, if you think about how far fish or some of these critters, what, what is their habitat zone around a body of water? Um, you can see from this graphic that, uh, that a lot of species will, like, while they are centered on a body of water, a riparian zone, their actual habitat range goes much, much uh, more broadly than that. So when you're managing the forest, even, you know, like 1,100 feet away, um, I don't know if this is feet or meters, Sally. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's feet. feet. Okay. So if you're, if you're even 1,100 feet away um, from a vernal pool or a significant water body, um, then it still impacts, uh, you know, bats, for instance, or turtles, like, geez, these little guys can get around. So um, you definitely want to make sure that you're managing your forest with birds and these other critters in mind, and maintaining those habitat features will benefit all the critters that you can see here. Um, I mentioned significant vernal pools. Um, this is, we're a little bit past the season right now, but they are very fun to spend time in uh, every spring, um, something I definitely have been uh, looking forward to. Um, but again, protecting significant vernal pools or even insignificant ones um, is important. And it, it, if you think about birds, you're also going to be enhancing habitat for these critters as well. Spotted salamanders, uh, our wood frogs, um, and a variety of, of turtles as well. We can go on. Let's see. Ah, so the importance of landscape. Um, when you get up on a mountain, it's easy to look out and see uh, from our from our perspective, uh, you know what it looks like on the landscape, and you get a, a sense of what the birds might be thinking of as they make that amazing uh, migrational journey uh, north and south each year. Um, so they're looking they're looking from the landscape level of what seems like a good place to set up camp. You know where do I want to stay this summer? Um, so the landscape context matters um, as we all talk about going up to camp, <laughs> um, thinking about being away from people as much as we can. Um, 
then uh, some, some birds care an awful lot about how intact is that forest around them. Um, so do you want to go to camp and have your neighbors right next door? Or do you want to go to camp and have nobody around for 50 miles? So landscape matters uh, in the context of forest bird habitat as well. Um, you want me, see, so, um, want me to jump in now? Sure, you're the wildlife biologist. <laughs> I can I can cover for it, but you're, you'll you'll make it sound better. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about more about that landscape context, which is particularly relevant for our RCPs that are trying to work across larger landscapes. And some of you may be familiar with the research that was done up at the University of Maine, where they kind of came up with this suggestion that we can use these two species, the Canada lynx and the American martin, as representative umbrella species or focal species, whatever you want to call them, for our young forests and for our older, more structurally complex forests. And if we manage across the landscape so that we provide habitat for both of these species, then we're going to provide habitat for the majority of our vertebrate species in Maine. We have about 60% of our vertebrate species use, um, or 80, 70%, sorry, 70% of our vertebrate species use the same type of habitat as American martin like, which is the sort of older structurally complex forest that we've been talking about mostly today. And then about 20% um, maybe, maybe a little less preferred younger forests similar to what a Canada lynx will use. They like the early successional, younger, maybe up to 20 year old spruce fir stands because the, there's a dense understory there where their favorite prey animal, the snowshoe hare, hangs out. And so when you're thinking about your particular property and how it fits in with the larger landscape, encourage you to think about are there opportunities to uh, what what is the mix of age forests across the landscape is it young is it predominantly young is it predominantly intermediate predominantly older and what we are suggesting as a goal and this would be a long-term goal for the forestry for Maine birds program is that 10 to 20 percent of the landscape be in young forest 40 to 50% be in older forests with at least 10% in what's considered a mature forest with over 100 years old, over 16 inch DBH diameter at breast height. Right now on the landscape in Maine, the light blue boxes are what are currently present and the dark blue are sort of what our goals, where we'd like to be over time. Um, no, 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 sorry, that's not right. <laughs> the current, um, this, this shows the range from 10 to 20% and from 20 to 40%, 40 to 50%. Right now across the main landscape, there's only about two to 4% of our forest that is in this older category. That's one of the reasons why we've been promoting the Forestry for Maine Birds program, which focuses more on this mature forest because that's where most of our forest birds nest and, and it's lacking across the landscape. We have a lot of intermediate age forest, particularly in the southern half of the state that has grown up since the agricultural heyday, and then a little bit of young forest and a lot of younger forest up in northern Maine where there's been extensive commercial harvesting that's been shifting in terms of the nature of that harvesting over the last 20 years in particular. So this is, this is really something to think about, and that's what we encourage landowners and foresters to think about. So in sort of thinking about landscape level, we're trying to promote these diverse mature stands that have lots of vegetation in the overstory, midstory, understory, gaps strewn throughout that forest, large woody, material that you can see where the pileated woodpeckers are and also in this photo of a northern hardwood forest where you've got this nice down logs and really good protection around the water. The older 
trees that are providing good shade that keeps the water cool. That's what trout need. And then the other thing to think about, as um, Amanda mentioned earlier, are really focusing in on where are these waterways, where are the riparian habitats? Because we know 85% of our vertebrates in Maine use these riparian areas or areas along streams, wetlands, lakes at some time during their life cycle. We have a few species like brook trout or mink that are really closely tied to the water itself, but then other species that use the areas around the stream for traveling. They let, it's kind of like their highway through the forest system. And so we want to really promote mature forests, particularly around these, in these riparian areas. And then another thing to think about is when you're looking across the landscape, where can you encourage connections between forest patches across roads or between wetlands that are on one side of the road and the other side of the road? So here you've got your riparian habitat that could be used as a highway by different animals for moving from one place to another, but there are also times when they need to cross from one forest patch to another and we want to encourage opportunities to keep those connections strong and keep them uh, across the landscape in multiple places. This is a map that was created through our, what's called our beginning with habitat program that works with towns on identifying where good habitat is that you might want to try to um, keep intact as you're going through the next phase of development. And we know it's really important to connect wetland habitats in particular because the vast majority of roadkill happens near wetlands and other water bodies. And these, these animals, they move slowly, they do move. Anybody who's been out on a big night in the spring trying to help salamanders or frogs cross the road knows that so many of them get killed by cars. Uh, we want to try to minimize that by keeping these wetland connections. And then the other thing to think about is, um, are there ways to encourage members of your land trusts or your forest landowners to do even more to protect, to provide cold water refuges, whether it's in it by providing shade along a stream or shade along a lake there, adopting practices such as Audubon at home, bringing nature home, bayscaping, yardscaping, Lake Smart. These are all pro programs that we have here in Maine that work with landowners on making sure that you're planting native plants, you're protecting shorelines, you're minimizing erosion, you're keeping the shade in intact, and providing um, habitat both for birds and other wildlife. And uh, finally, I, I wanted to include a little bit about the importance of connecting waterways because I know a number of the RCPs that sat in on an earlier brief conversation we had about this are more focused on watersheds. And so Maine Audubon has been working with a, a lot of partners on a program called Stream Smart here in Maine, which has really been focused on how do we reconnect our waterways. And I start with this graphic because it's such a great example of how fish move. We've been talking a lot about, about birds and how they move and they migrate from South America up to Maine every year, but we also have fish that move every year. Some that come from the ocean into our freshwater systems, some that are in freshwater systems all year round. But during the course of the year, they need to move between foraging areas, nursery areas, spawning areas, deep water refuges where they can find cold or cold water refuges where they can hole up during the heat of the summer. And this is going to be increasingly important as we face warming climate in the, in the next several decades. So our Stream Smart program is designed to work with landowners, land trusts, municipalities on, on uh, removing any barriers and we have we have now a database of 30,000 crossings where roads cross streams, where we have collected information about what that <clears throat> barrier looks like. Is it functioning? Is it not functioning? We know that 
40, 50% of our barrier, our culverts are barriers at least part of the year, if not more. So um, we've been promoting the idea that you wanna replace these barriers with structures that span the stream, that match the elevation of the stream, that provide passage for both fish and many other species as well. And the bottom line is you wanna let the stream act like a stream. So this would be an example of what a great stream from our crossing looks like. And um, we have worked with the state on getting funding, providing funding for organizations to do this. And, and you know, Aaron, I know in Down East Maine, there's been a tremendous amount of work through the program called Project Share on fixing a lot of broken streams with this kind of stream smart crossing. And we're trying to do more and more across the state. And we're trying to integrate that a little bit with our Forestry for Maine Birds program because what's good for the forest birds is also good for fish and vice versa. So that is the end of our slides and we are more than happy to take questions. And I'd be curious to hear from folks who are outside of Maine um, in particular, you know, what how, what comparisons they see between this program and other programs <clears throat> that they're familiar with, <clears throat> things that we might be able to learn from you. Uh, before, but before we go there, I do want to mention that we have, in addition to doing these workshops that Amanda described, we have been working closely with landowners in Western Maine and landowners in Central Maine on helping them get funding to write wildlife friendly management plans, fish and bird friendly management plans. And um, just yesterday I was talking with uh, one of my coworkers who said they, she's been getting calls from, we have over 50 people who have expressed interest in the central mm -hmm. main area of meeting with a district forester and putting, and then potentially putting together a management plan. One of whom, has over 500 acres and he's super excited. He wants to update his management plan with wildlife friendly uh, practices. And so we're, we're expanding a little bit more into the realm of working with landowners on putting those plans together. But we, unlike some other states, we're not interested in doing the habitat assessments and the management plans ourselves. We're working with our local foresters, our district foresters, the state foresters to help make that happen. We're just sort of providing the outreach and the background and connecting landowners with the folks, the professionals who are doing that work. So yes, we have one final poll for you on yeah. what you think some of the biggest takeaways from this program were. Yeah, we usually wrap up in the field by asking folks to share an aha moment or something that kind of struck them during the workshop. And it's a good feedback for us because we see what what really stuck out in folks' folks' minds and what they're taking home with them uh, from a workshop. So if you don't mind sharing your, we sorry we had to make this multiple choice, but an aha moment or two uh, that you had, uh, we'd love to capture that as well. So, and we're also very happy to take questions. Uh, we talked longer than I thought we would. Um, <laughs> so, all right, I'll let it run for another 10 seconds or so. And Eileen is asking, she says, I'm interested in all the ways that you engage and work with foresters on getting expertise in silviculture with birds in mind. Um, do you want me to talk about that, Sally? Yes, please. All right, I'm gonna end the polling and share it. Um, and that folks can multitask if you want, it's okay. Um, so uh, yeah, so how, how do we engage with foresters? So right from the get-go, when we started this project, uh, we, had, uh, we had a kind of an initial steering committee meeting um, where we engage uh, different stakeholders, um, both from the industrial side, from the consulting forester side, from the state side, um, you know, wildlife biologists. We wanted to get buy-in into the project. This was in early 2014 when we started. Um, and throughout, working closely with the Maine Forest Service was critical uh, to getting the kind of the buy-in and also the, the perspective of foresters. And also for me, working for the Forest Stewards Guild, um, as a forester, we wanted to make sure that this program would, would make sense for foresters that would be using these tools, um, as well as for, you know, for the other aspects of the program. So working with those partners closely is essential. And I'm sure that Nancy Patch would agree um, that working with your forestry agency is really critical to ensuring that you have a successful program. Um, I hope that answers your question. Are there other questions out there? 
feel free to pipe in. We have so few people. I think you could also unmute and talk if you'd if you'd rather do that. Hi, Sally and Amanda, it's Sarah. Um, thanks so much. That was a great talk. Um, I have a quick question about what share of the forest management plans um, that you or your partner foresters um, create for these landowners do you believe are acted upon that where the, the management actually then occurs? Sally, do you want to tackle that one? We don't really know. <laughs> you know, we're still, yeah. we're still early in the process, despite that fact that we've been doing these workshops for some time now. Um, we, our initial workshops really targeted foresters and only in the last two years have we really started offering more workshops for landowners as well and, um, and land trusts. But the, so we've done, and, and because it's taken, and then the two projects that I just mentioned that we're doing in Western Maine and in Central Maine are still at the point where we just, we're either just getting people interested in participating or in Western Maine, we're a little bit further ahead. So we have over 20 some people who have signed up with the NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, to write management plans. And, but it's taken so long to get the funding allocated from NRCS. They're, they're just getting that. They're either getting their approval now or maybe they're getting their money now. And so we're not sure, you know, how soon they will actually be implementing that. But we've also been working with the New England Forestry Foundation in Western Maine, and they have been offering some funding to folks who actually want to do practices on the ground, and they've been getting a pretty good response, a lot of which are people that we have worked with initially on writing the management plans who are now ready to do something with those plans, and others who, who are just interested in either doing something new with New England Forestry Foundation or who have um, an existing plan and they're ready to act on it. So it's, it's variable. We've done, we've done some surveys, uh, follow-up surveys with people asking them, how likely are you to do something now that you've been through the workshop? And the response has been pretty high. I couldn't give you an exact number, but we haven't gone back. And we, we've, we asked people, have you done anything yet? And in most cases, they just haven't gotten there yet. So it's a long-term process. It's a long-term investment. Of course. Yeah, yeah. And as, we, as we saw from the trail map, it's a journey, you know, it's a journey for everybody who's, uh, who's involved and for landowners, especially in, you know, maybe in Southern Maine who have not thought about doing a timber harvest or they thought that cutting trees was bad. I've heard the same thing in North Carolina. Um, then just getting them to think about cutting trees is a huge step. And then all, all the steps that would go into that, how do you how do you have a management plan? How do you prepare a timber you know timber harvesting plan? How do you find the right forest or how do you find the logger that you feel comfortable working on your land? Um, it takes time, so it's definitely a journey and a process. So while we don't have like you know instant management plans, you know unlike some of the other um, foresters to the birds programs in Maine, we didn't choose to have like teams of biologists and foresters like writing plans for everybody. Um, our approach was to kind of start with like the forester audience who worked in the logger audience and the landowner audience. Um, over time, as we develop these educational materials, kind of getting buy-in from folks that would be, uh, you know, thinking about the forest from the bird's perspective. Um, so we've taken a, a different approach um, all around. But on the flip side, people that come <laughs> to the workshops, um, you know, we had an outstanding tree farmer of the year who had was very, you know, sure about his park-like management of his land. And, you know, after coming to our, you know, to a workshop or two, he, he decided, you know, he he set up his, his uh, he, he leaves some areas messy instead of tidying everything up because he realizes it's better for the birds and he appreciates it more. So um, he's already bought in with you know, having a management plan that he's happy with, but he is changing his perspective and how he manages his own land on the ground. And I'll, I'll, add, one, one thing. I'll add one other th quick thing to that is um, our district foresters have said uniformly that they are hearing from people who have come through our program or known about the program and they are convinced that they never would have interacted with those people before or unless they participated in the program. So it's that, definitely that, that is a great, that's a yeah. great data point. And I think it's also 
the, just the whole issue that it takes people time, landowners time for them to both understand the opportunity, uh, reach out to a forester, and also for the forester, foresters to engage landowners and have it move towards actual management, on the ground management. It's also a reason why we thought it would be great to bring, you know, the Audubon organization's efforts together with what RCPs are trying to do, because in that case, and also land trusts are working in landscapes where they actually want to see landowners move along this ladder of engagement from awareness to stewardship to management, you know, and potentially land protection down the road in these areas that are, are most important to the landscape, especially for, you know, for example, uh, sustaining threatened bird species. So it's a, it's a great reason, kind of a case for why we want to bring this part, you know, partners together to, to have us, um, you know, save and, and conserve species together versus separately. Um, Eileen, do you have another question or is, is there another? Uh, Nancy, yeah. sounds like Nancy, you have a question? Nope. Well, I know Just we're almost out of time, so yep. I, I don't want to use up the last few minutes, but I find it really interesting um, that talking to the foresters and getting the foresters engaged is essential, but it's not the only thing. And we want to be really sure that we keep communicating with the landowners, um, possibly landscape managers, um, because that'll help us pick our targets as as we go forward with where we want to where we want to really invest in outreach. Yeah, one of the interesting things that has happened is we have foresters who are now bringing this idea to their landowners. For example, on Tuesday. I was working with a Stanton, Stanton Bird Club it was, um, and they said, oh yeah, their forester brought the idea of using forestry for Maine birds in management of their property to them. And then on the other hand, we have landowners, like last year I had a landowner call me up and say, from the Midcoast area, call me up and say, hey, I'm really interested in doing this forestry for Maine birds thing. Can you come talk to me about what I can do in my property? I said, no, I really can't. <laughs> just come to one property, but I tell you what, if you can get together a group of at least 25 neighbors who you think might be interested in this, I'll come down and do a workshop for you. Mm -hmm. So he did. And, and he had 25 different folks from the Midcoast area and they all, they all got together. And one of the, one, again, like Amanda said, one of the take homes at the end was, oh man, now I don't have to spend all that time trying to clean up my woods. You just saved me a whole lot of work. <laughs> Um, but they were really super excited and the idea of, of they had neighbors that had adjoining land and they were going to be talking about trying to do mm. collective management plan, you know, that would cross the boundaries of the properties and have one person that's, that's working great. On landowners. Mm. So it's coming from both directions. In that mm. case, the landowner, the landowner invited his logger to come to the workshop as well. So the logger could learn a little bit about what we were trying to do. Okay. Well, I think that's, uh, we're nearing the end of our time. Um, I want to thank Sally and Amanda for a great program and for all of you for joining us uh, and your great questions. I'm hoping that people will continue to engage on Basecamp, especially if you have ideas for additional webinars. I think that's really an ongoing conversation that we should be having because I think we all learned a lot from what's, what's going on in Maine and each of us are, are doing various activities and programs. We, we, that's one of the benefits of coming together is really learning and benefiting from each other's lessons. Uh, so we have, I think we're, we're out of time. So again, I, have a great afternoon. Hope you're all well and stay safe. And Bill. we'll see you around uh, either, yep. Sorry, sure. before we go on that vein of, um, yeah. we are going to have another webinar. Um, I don't have the time scheduled yet, but it will be with Grasslands. Okay. And we're in the process. Nice. So um, it's a little slower with what's going on in our world right now, but um, I will yep. announce that over base camp and it's same sort of thing to grassland programs that are happening in New England. And we'll, we'll bring those together and discuss those programs as well. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sarah. Yep. All right. Have, everybody have a good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Take care. And we'll, we'll post a recording, recording of this on Basecamp for us to share, for all of you to share with your networks Great. and organizations. Thanks. Thanks again, you guys.
Great job. Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 -bye.